My name is Lisa Nolent. I'm a sex historian for my sins. I've been tracking the pansexual revolution in which we are living through at the moment. My organization is called the Marriage, Sex, and Culture Group of Anglican Mainstream. So that's the site. That's kind of the parental body. We are um, an arm that researches campaigns, explores what is going on, exposes what is going on, and then develops positive responses. Okay, so what is going on? We're living through a massive sexual revolution. That's what's going on, in my view. So what what, what revolution? Uh, well, it is uh, basically blue sky sexuality. and So what is that? That means... Um, increasingly what is coming to the fore are different kinds of sexual couplings, um, family arrangements, etc. And the reason why I'm concerned is that I think my group thinks it's very damaging for society because most of the time the nasty underbelly of this is not apparent. See, for the longest time, a, a good example is pornography. We were told pornography is a little bit of naughty fun you know, enjoy yourself, etc. Well, we now know that pornography has massive roadkill. So what, for example? What's wrong with pornography? Okay. Well, basically, if you get hooked, and a lot of people do, you become impotent. That's one of the things that's, that it damages you. It damages relationships. It damages how you view people of the opposite sex or same sex, whatever. It, uh, it's damaging. Uh, and what about uh, the idea of you know uh, sort of sexual relations between same sexes? I mean that's much bigger now, isn't it? Because homosexuality in the nineteen sixties was made legal, so there's been big changes. Correct. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, that is exactly right. The LGBT are the first of a cohort to come out, but there are many other sexualities that are making the same claims and on the same basis. And if we go there, I think we are into serious freefall. But then you say freefall, but surely this is just basic human rights. I mean, people can do what they want with their own bodies, surely. Uh, well, yes, but then they should also need to know that the costs, there are costs attached to them, like soaring STDs. I mean, basically all this stems, to be honest, from Alfred Kinsey, who's the father of the sex revolution. He was into different kinds of sexual relationships, sex with animals, sex with children, sex, same sex, he had hundreds, if not more, partners. But, I mean, the thing is, the LGBT lobby yeah. are, are not interested in any of that, are they? They're just talking about consenting adults. Oh, correct. That's right. But I think what I'm saying is they cl make the claims that they include everyone, but they don't. And all these, and so one of the things my group does is we track all these other alternative sexualities who are saying, our kids are killing themselves, we're, we are being damaged, we're tired of being in the closet, we're coming out too. So I guess what I'm after is a free and frank discussion of the whole pansexual revolution. And in my view, it's really toxic. But most of the time, because once you go there, you're just shut down as, oh, that's hate-filled or whatever. We don't even, we don't get very far. So I'm delighted to be here. Okay, so uh, tell us what you think is wrong with this then, because many people who are lesbian, gay, transsexual, whatever, yep. will say that actually this is just me, you know, this is how I am, tough, get used to it. Oh, correct. Now, I shared my home with a lovely gay guy. He died of AIDS. A close bisexual friend fell in love with me. That was just fine. I agree in live and let live. But the deal is... Because all these other sexualities are saying the same thing. They're saying, hold on, why, this is me too. Why can't I come out? And our Stonewalls or other groups are saying, get back in the closet. You can't, of course you can't come out because you will ruin things for us. I believe in live and let live. But what I am concerned about is we don't know the, f uh, most of the time, the underbelly of this stuff is not coming to the fore. Okay, the well, take, take us to that underbelly for a minute. What were the real damaging things that you say will happen with this revolution? Well, basically, people are seen far more as commodities. Huge number in terms of SDIs, STDs, psychological brokenness. Basically, see, sex is fire and sex is glue. So you have lots of different partners. You glue. See, in, that is what ha is happening in your brain. You're gluing when you're making love, when you're having sex. You're gluing to all these different people. So it is, makes it harder 
to form stable, lasting, monogamous relationships if you are giving yourself like that beforehand. But, but don't some people see it just as a bit of fun? Oh, of course, of course. But you, you well might see it as a bit of fun, um, but your body remembers differently. See, increase it. See, that's what oxytocin is emitted when you have an orgasm. It see and vasopressin for males. It does. There, there's an act that happens. Or there's a physiological um, act in your body that happens when you have sex. Oh, so, how is this sexual revolution affecting society now, and how will it affect it more in the future? Okay. Well, basically, um, it's twofold. One, there's huge damages in terms of costs, family breakdown. Um, people going from partner to partner, children not knowing who their moms or dads are, and children desperately need to know who their moms and dads are. And we are seeing that now. Why? Because it's important to know, for most people, they do want to know where they've come from. They want to know their roots. It's very important to know what my heritage is in terms of medical stuff, in terms of cultural stuff, in terms of moral formation. We uh, adults can play around far more, um, and they do. And sometimes they pay for it. Other times it doesn't seem to. But kids, it's a very different situation for kids, and that's really what we are most worried about. The church. In what way are you connected to the church then? Um, well, I'm an Anglican, and um, uh, I am with Anglican Mainstream, which is a website. We track this cultural stuff, um, and we. We are very concerned about what is going on right now in the Anglican Communion. That's the huge global body. The Church of England is a very, very small part. So the Anglicans, uh, let's just be clear about this, it's actually largely the old British colonies, isn't it, including the United States? Okay, the Anglican Communion, well, let's see... Um, the Anglican Communion is actually global. It's not just the old empire or, you know, whatever. I understand why you say that. But, for instance, in Nigeria, they have more Anglicans there, from what I understand, than all the rest of the Anglicans in the world. See, the Church of England is actually very small num numerically, and it's shrinking. But this week, the Church of England has been looking at uh, same-sex marriage in the church, so mm -hmm. whether or not to conduct same-sex marriage ceremonies in churches across Britain. Mm -hmm. That's right, they are. So what do you, have you got any thoughts and advice for the church as they're discussing this? Well, um, I think they are basically faced with a, a choice um, they can either be go progressive, that's their term. I try to use people, you know, the group's own terms. The progressives are wanting to adapt the church to modern whatever, whatever, ways of thinking, etc., so-called modern ways of thinking. Um, and traditionalists like myself hang out with Jesus, and Jesus was crystal clear in terms of sexual issues. Well, many uh, many people will say, no, actually he wasn't. You know, that, that, that there's very little in the New Testament. There's a lot in the Old Testament, but not much in the New Testament about sexuality that Jesus was came along to sort of liberate people. Do you know the actual um, detailed analysis of that is actually quite incorrect. He spoke more about sex than he spoke about poverty. He spoke tons. And see, be, people think, oh, well, there are only, let's say, six for, uh, bits in the New Testament that deal with homosexuality. But Jesus spoke tons about porneia, which included homosexuality. And Paul specifically targeted homosexuality. But I'm not just talking about homosexuality. I'm talking about any sexual sin, outside, or sexual can, uh, behavior outside of... So did Jesus actually say a marriage has to be between a man and a woman? He didn't, did he? Oh, yes, of course he did. Sorry, yes, yes. And he was very clear. He used two words in the Greek for sexual sin. One was moik and what the other was porneia. And porneia included incest, rape, you name it, you name it. It's anything outside of heterosexual sex in, a, in marriage, heterosexual marriage. I suppose you might call it fornication, isn't it? Out, sex outside marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, so what about also the, the, the church at the moment is looking at the idea of women bishops. What, what are your principles? Are there any principles that you've got on that? Okay, well, the church in England and in many other countries has already ordained women bishops. So I think that's probably a, 
um, a, an issue that has come and gone. Now, some of the I work very closely with colleagues, let's say in Kenya, and I'd love to tell you a little bit about that later on. But they um, ordain women priests, but not bishops. So that there are various views on that. Okay. Uh, Archbishop, is we're we going to get a woman Archbishop of Canterbury, and would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, well, I I don't think it would be a good thing. But, um, but what, what's the principle against this then? What, what, why should anybody say, well, a woman shouldn't be a bishop or an archbishop? Okay, because some people would say that um, that is somehow representing, or, or that in Scripture there is in the New Testament a clear model of male headship, just like Christ is the head of the church. That's that's the paradigm that they are working with. Other people would say, well, there were women um, in there were women in leadership all throughout the Bible, so they wouldn't have a problem with that. So there can be people who are very biblically concerned and invested who go either way on that one. What about the Catholic Church and this whole vow of celibacy for priests? Well, um, I have good Catholic friends, and they they um, who are devout and practicing in their faith, and they go both ways. Some think that priests should be allowed to marry. And actually, historically, it used to be that priests in the Catholic Church could marry a long time ago, many, many centuries ago. But um, I can see both sides of this. So what do you think is the future for the family, generally? I'm concerned about the future of the family because basically adults are not taking seriously um, their need to invest in their marriages and their kids. And you don't, they seem to get away with it okay, but the next generation is the generation that pays for it. So I am concerned. I, I used to listen, I, I've worked with kids for decades, and I would hear them talk about how their parents simply were so into their own stuff, they simply could not be good mums and dads. And kids desperately need parents who are invested in them. Well, there's another side of all this, and that is that uh, now you've got both parents, pretty much most families, having to go out to work in order to earn enough money to pay the rent or the mortgage uh, so they don't get to spend much time with children. And, you know, that is a really dangerous thing. I mean, I purposefully did not work while my little my while my daughter was growing up because I wanted to invest in her because I knew before she wouldn't she she'd be grown up before we knew it and so I so we just lived at a lower standard but kids very much need parents need their mothers and fathers to be invested in them and and to be honest that's the only thing that lasts you know you are I don't know how old I'm almost 60 before we know it, you see, time passes, and it's what you have in terms of your children. That's your, in some ways, a time bottle that goes of you that goes into the future. So why is family so important to you? Because it's the bedrock of society, I guess, and it's the place where um, the next generation can, be, can grow up, can learn healthy habits, can become who they really are meant to be. And kids really need their mums and dads if at all possible. Now, I married a widower. He didn't have, so my stepson didn't have his mother, so I was the best he had, but uh, he was at a loss. It, it, it damaged both of us, actually. It was hard work. So I really do believe in marriage and the family, and that's what this group is about. Tell us about you've got some sort of uh, event, yes. events. And I know you're, you're actually yourself based here in Bristol, aren't you? I am And indeed. you're the chair of the group. Yeah, I am indeed. I am indeed. Yes. Um, okay. Well, one of the things that we do in terms of positive responses is we work with partners around the world that are also that also believe in marriage, the family, traditional values that are good, that are strong, that are whatever. Anyway, and one of our partners is in Kenya, and um, we are trying to raise about ten to fifteen thousand quid by wait for it. Um, selling used toiletries, clothes, shoes, da, 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 all this stuff that often is given to charity shops and then just ends up in landfill because no one wants to buy it. So this charity is with the Anglican Church in Kenya. It's working with children who are, you, know, you talk about the family, there we have feral children who can earn more by prostitution in a day or two than a school teacher can in a month. But 
what, in fact, uh, got this from a Nairobi um, policeman who works with these this population, these poor kids, um, that some of these kids are so damaged by all the sex. See, there's a huge Western tourist trade here. So uh, these kids are so damaged, they end up having to wear nappies. That's how it lands. See, that's the kind of thing, and I didn't want to kind of go into this, but extreme sex practices are part of what we are very concerned about because it's damaging. So these poor folk in Kenya, they don't have an NHS to stitch them up. So anyway, what we are doing is we're working with a group that works with these boys who are hardened, who are angry, who are um, uh, so twisted, so broken, but they come alongside the head of the project was himself raised. His family was broken. He, um, his stepfather beat the deuce out of him. Dreadful, dreadful. So he would kick him out of the home. The mother did nothing. Uh, lots of younger brothers and sisters. But he did, never knew his own father. Um, so the stepfather would kick him out. Um, he would sleep in under trees, in a ditch, whatever. And the only kind neighbor to take him in, in the middle of the night... This project director woke up to find something. Yeah. And basically, the local pedophile was the only one who would let him sleep in his home, would give him food, etc., etc. Well, this so damaged this young man that he came to the end of his rope. Um, he was with his boyfriend. He was just at the end, at the end. It was so bad. So someone very kindly, some kind person said, you know, there's a really nice priest down the road. Why don't you just go and talk to him? Maybe he'll make you feel better. I don't know. This priest turned this boy's life around. He was told he was Christ to him, totally invested in him, put him back together, years of counseling, years of education, years of whatever. So now this young man is running the program. So he has a way with broken kids because he gets it. He was there. So I would love to hear from people who would like to help. Oh, and finally, the other thing is these people do not want handouts. They're sick and tired of handouts. The dependency culture is all wrong. It just breeds more dependency and whatever. So he, my project director, very much believes in microenterprise and encouraging these lads to be able to stand on their own. So this is the other aspect of this. So I, I would love to hear from anyone who could help on that. So used stuff. I would love to hear. So my email, Dr. Lisa, so that's D-R-L-I-S-A, 1957-1957 at gmail.com. You keep talking about investing in people. We normally associate that term with money. Yeah, um, yes, but uh, uh, I find that many people already have causes that they're very – committed to, and I totally get that. But what I'm asking is for what people don't want, which is, you know, they could happily give away their uh, toiletries or they don't like the smell of that perfume or whatever, whatever. Um, yes, I'd love money, but um, to me, this is, uh, I call this the greenest um, kind of charity around because we do s retrieve stuff that would otherwise end up in landfill. And um, that stuff goes to the Ukraine, and then the monies go to Kenya to help these lads stand on their own two feet and get something of a chance in okay, life. Okay, where can we find details about you and the MSC online then, or, uh, uh, or other by other means? You know, whereabouts are, yeah, yeah, people yeah, sure. get in touch? Sure, sure. So uh, my the, the website that I work with is Anglican Mainstream. So that's www, or, sorry, yeah, Anglican mainstream.org and my email is as i've said dr lisa 1957 at gmail.com you're listening to dialectradio.co.uk your local community radio run by volunteers log on to our website at dialectradio.co.uk to find out more yeah. 